Welcome, folks, to another episode of Tank Talk presented by KG Tropicals, Universal Rocks, and Dustin'sFishTanks.com. My name is John Hudson, flying solo today. And when you hear the announcement that I have to make, you're going to understand why we've got so much stuff going on right now. It's absolutely crazy. And I've got the biggest announcement to make that I've made in a long time. It's going to be the kind of announcement that when I make it, you're Initial reaction is going to be, oh man, that sucks, but I'm here to tell you that it's a good announcement, and you can, if you can tell by the sound of my voice, I mean, I'm actually in a really good mood, really excited to be here in front of the microphone today, so I can't wait to talk about that announcement. And once we're done with that, we're going to get into an email that literally just came in at 7.45 this morning. A lot of emails have come in, but this one caught my eye, and I thought it would be a lot of fun to answer. And then we're also going to get into the topic of the day, which today is going to be a whole lot of fun because it's going to be common fish keeping myths. This is a series of videos that I'm going to do, not all about myths, but I'm going to do a series that's probably going to take up the next two or three episodes. And the series is going to be common fish keeping blank, common fish keeping fill in the blank. And every single week, it's going to be something new. This week is going to be myths. So we got a lot of stuff to get to. So let's just stop messing around. Let's just do it. Okay, so the announcement. This is the big one, folks. This is the announcement uh, that has me so excited. And like I said, I I need you to understand that when you first hear this, you're going to think this is going to be something bad. But I promise you, it's not. I I would not be excited and, and be, have so much enthusiasm right now if this was not actually good news. Um, it's bad news initially, but it's gonna be really, really good. So here's the deal. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Times are tough. Uh, times are tough industry wide. Uh, the, the tropical fish industry has taken a huge hit over the last year. And of course this happens while I'm in the process of trying to establish a brand new business. And I just said, I, you know, it's me. You know, it's me and Lisa. It's not just me. Um, I had a meeting with uh, one of our distributors the other day, and this is a distributor that is local. Uh, they they used to supply like 40 or 50 stores that are were local to this area, and he absolutely shocked me the other day when he said that his stores that he's supplying now have dwindled down to four, and KG Tropicals is one of them. And let me just tell you, folks, we don't buy a lot from him. And it has nothing to do with him or from the products that he has. It's that we deal in fish. We don't deal in supplies and all of that. We sell the supplies through our Amazon affiliate links. We don't do it from our store. Uh, And the the fish that we sell, African cichlids, he doesn't really carry. So we don't buy any fish from him. We just periodically will go to him and buy some supplies for the shop. And so there's really only three stores that he's distributing to and that's unfortunate. To go from 40 to 50 down to really three is shocking. But that shows you what's happening in this industry. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Amazon is one of them. The big box stores are one of them. And online retailers, which we are. And so, you know, that has put us in a position where we've got a lot of potential. And this is really exciting, the things that are happening but times are still really, really tough. I'm not going to lie to you. And they're so tough that Lisa and I, we sat down a, a few weeks ago. We've been talking about this for a while. And we said, look, you know what? We're, we're in dire straits here. Uh, this is, this is, you know, rock bottom. We got to figure out what we're going to do. Are we going to close our business and go out of business, which would be the most tragic thing ever? Or, Are we going to continue to fight like we've always done, not give up, and just figure out a way to make this work? And which one do you think we chose? We chose to continue on and continue to press forward. However, if we're going to do that, we have to make some significant changes to our business. And the biggest change of all is what I'm here to announce to you right now. We're moving. We're moving our operation of KG Tropicals to our house. Now, if you're someone who has followed us from the beginning on the YouTube channel, you remember some of the videos that I did. My first videos, we were in a two-car garage that was at our home. 
Well, that's not where this is going to be because we don't live there anymore. We had to move back in the summer. Uh, we're in a new place now. And this place has a wide open, unfinished basement. It's actually where I'm sitting right now talking to you. The basement is not that big, but it's wide open. Uh, well, the space on that side is wide open. Basically, the basement is a big square with a wall going right down the middle. And one half of the basement is where I'm in right now, which is the, the studio, but it's also got, you know, our water heater and furnace and all of that in it. The other side of the basement is wide open, nothing in it at all, and that's where the uh, the the fish tanks are going to go. Now I should I just lied to you. I just told a bold faced lie. I said there's nothing over there. There is stuff over there, uh, but it belongs to Lisa's son, who is a as you know is a marine, and he's no longer here. So we're going to move his stuff um, up into a, a the the back corner of a bedroom upstairs, and uh, utilize that space for the fish tanks. So this is a, a huge undertaking. Obviously, uh, it's something that's really, really big and my back hurts just thinking about it. But, uh, but in the end, this is something that's going to work out really well. Uh, we, we started our lease at our shop in December and as you know, it is now December. So, uh, we can, we can go ahead and move out of there and bring everything back here. And, uh, and save considerably on the expenses of this business. Now this is, I'm going to be honest with you. This is the second time that I've actually recorded this because in the first time I kind of went into details that just got a little bit boring talking about how expensive a business like this is to operate. Uh, and this is why I'm redoing it because I, I went overboard and, and I got a little bit too detailed and I was afraid that people might start turning things off, but I, I, what I was trying to do was give you an idea of what it's like to operate a business like this and, and the expenses involved and everything else. It's outrageous how much money KG Tropicals has to make just to stay in business. It, it's outrageous. And so we're going to dramatically decrease that amount by doing what we're doing here. Um, I mean, I'm not going to start talking about numbers, but it's dramatic. Uh, what we're going to save by bringing it here. So what does this mean to you, the, the fan of the, the podcast, the fan of the YouTube channel? What does this mean? And, and also you, the customer of KG Tropicals, because I know a lot of customers listen to this. They, they tell me that they do. Um, it doesn't mean anything <laughs> to you. The only people that are going to be affected by this are fans of the YouTube channel because you're going to get, you're going to be in for a treat because the studio is going to completely change. We're going to take the tanks that we have in here right now. We're going to move them to the side. They're still going to be here. We're going to move them to the side and we're going to bring in two of the big tanks, not the 240, but we're going to bring in our 150 gallon, which is a six foot 150 gallon, really tall, really nice tank. And then we're going to bring in a 125. So our backdrop for the studio is going to be much better than it is now. It's just going to be all fish tank rather than, you know, a little tank and then wall. So that's going to be exciting. So YouTube will get a big jump uh, because, you know, the, the atmosphere in the videos is going to be better. And also bringing those two additional tanks over here is just going to, it's not only going to be a better looking studio, but it's also going to increase our options as far as the backdrops, that we use, you know, we can move the camera and, uh, and not have you looking at the same tank at the same angle every single week. So I'm excited about that. YouTube fans should definitely be excited about that. The podcast, it isn't going to change a bit because nothing's changing about the podcast. And as far as our business goes, um, we are not going to be open to walk in traffic anymore, uh, because this is our house and we're not, we live in a neighborhood. We can't put a sign out front that says KG Tropicals, come on in. You know, we're, we're not allowed to do that. The county would not allow us to do that. So we're not going to be open to the public. We will allow some of our regulars. I'm holding up the quote signs. The, our regular customers that live locally, they will still be welcome to come here uh, and purchase fish direct from us. We're not going to, you know, forbid people from coming here uh, to purchase fish. So you know, really not a whole lot is going to change except for the address that you would go to. 
Um, but again, you know, our address is not going to be listed anywhere. It's not going to be out there for anybody to know where it is. Um, because, you know, the, with the paparazzi and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it just gets out of control. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I'm joking, but so this is a, this is a huge thing here. I mean, I, I, I think I've said that a few times. I'm stumbling all over my words here because I, I'm not really sure what more to say about it. It's a massive project. It's something that's going to take us about a month and a half before it's officially done. Uh, the end of January is when we're, you know, shooting for to be completely out of the other shop, uh, and have everything settled. If you're wondering, um, I, we can't bring every single tank here. I mean, we don't have enough room. It's not the biggest house in the world. Um, the, the space that we're going to be putting the tanks in is a little bit smaller than the space that we have our tanks in now. So it, it, we're going to end up with about 160 to 165 tanks here in our basement. And um, so that is a decrease from what we have now. But, you know, it, we only ever really use that many tanks anyway. We've got 220 tanks in the shop running right now, but we don't always have fish in every single one. So I, our inventory is certainly not going to take a hit. Uh, we're going to have the same inventory available that we do now. Actually, we hardly have any inventory available right now. But when we usually stock our tanks, it's going to be the same uh, that we've had all along. So. You know, any way you look at this, this is a good thing. The only thing that's bad about it is that we have to move all these tanks, and that's not fun. I got a bad back already, and it's just the two of us. So that is the only bad thing about it. I am not looking at this as a negative at all. I'm not looking at this as the one step forward and two steps back type thing. I'm, I'm not looking at it that way. I'm looking at this as we're taking one step back so that down the road, we can take two steps forward and actually do it the right way instead of prematurely like we did last time, which put us in this position to begin with. You know, Lisa and I have learned a lot over the last couple of years. We've made some mistakes. I'm not going to tell you we haven't. Uh, we've done a lot of things really well, too. And so we're going to be able to take all of that and just kind of push the reset button. You know, reset, reboot, regroup, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. That's what we're going to be doing here. And, you know, ultimately the dream of, of Lisa and myself is to own and operate a tropical fish business from our home. So guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be doing exactly that. Now, of course, the, the ultimate dream is to have a big fish house built on our property that, you know, is a, away from the house and not um, in the basement. But this is one step closer to what we have always wanted. So again, one step back to take two steps forward, not a big deal. I am excited about this, not excited about the process, but once it's done, we're going to be much happier and things are going to move much smoothly. All right. So that's enough of that. Uh, I know I went on there pretty long too, but, uh, you know, now you know what's going on with us. You know what's going on, uh, with our, our big move here. And uh, so it's time to go ahead and move on to this email. Okay, so like I said earlier, I got this email this morning and it just jumped out at me uh, and it looked like it was something that was a lot of fun to answer. And so I wanted to go ahead and include this in today's episode. The email is from Amy Stewart and she says, Hey, my name is Amy Joe, and I have two Oscars, approximately four to six inches in a 55 gallon tank. I can't keep it clean. Well, it's the smell that's the problem. I just cleaned the tank four days ago, and it already smells like poop. <laughs> I don't know if it's maybe my water. I have well water that is high in iron and has a sulfur smell to it. Please help me. Okay, this is this is a simpler problem to fix than you might think, um, but it actually might be an, an expensive fix. It's all going to depend. I used to have this problem. This is why it jumped out at me. I used to live on a farm that was a, on a horse farm. And the, the whole area, it had been a horse farm for a hundred years. And so the soil in the area was just gross. And this house was on a well. The water literally came out yellow and smelled like sulfur. I mean, I had to use bottled water and all that kind of stuff. 
And in that situation for me, what I ended up doing was I, I bought, um, I don't even remember what it was, if it was like 10 five gallon buckets, uh, with the lids. And I would go to my sister's house who lived about, I don't know, five, six miles away and had crystal clear, pristine, perfect water out of her well. And I would fill those buckets up and I would lug them back and forth and use those to do my water changes. Um, that was the way that I handled it. And that might be something that you should consider if you have somebody, uh, another source of water that you can use. If you don't, there is another alternative. Uh, and this is something that I started doing in the other house and then I quickly stopped and, and I'll explain why. Uh, a small reverse osmosis system. Uh, you can buy these for, I'm going to say 150 to $200. Uh, the systems that you would typically mount underneath your sink and you can very easily modify these systems to just drain right into a bucket instead of going into like a little storage tank, uh, which you would use as drinking water. You can have this system drain the water, filter the water and put it into a like 35 gallon trash can is what I used to do. And this way you've got reverse osmosis water, which takes out all of that iron, takes out all of that sulfur and you get good, nice crystal clean water. I did that in that farmhouse. And it worked beautifully. The problem with it was there was such a high iron content and such a high, uh, just amount of metal in that water that the, the, the membrane in the reverse osmosis system would get clogged up really fast. And they're really expensive to change the cartridges on it. Uh, and so what I would end up doing is cleaning it, not, which you can't really clean it. I mean, it's not very easy to do. And so once those things get clogged up, they lose a lot of their efficiency and you just got to replace them and they can get pretty expensive. So if you got plenty of money, Amy, you might want to go ahead and look into one of those reverse osmosis systems. Um, if you're on a limited budget like me, you may want to call up mom or, or call up your good friend and, and see if they've got a better water supply at their house and they're not too far away and just lug it back and forth in buckets. I know it's a pain in the butt, but you, you want to take good care of your Oscars, don't you? You have a 55 gallon tank. If you get five gallon buckets, you, you'd really only need to get five and you could do a 50% water change. It's not that big of a deal to transport five, five gallon buckets around. Um, you know, and that will help you to keep your tank clean and smelling fresh. The other thing would be carbon. Carbon is, is one of those things that a lot of people, uh, frown upon. They say it's, you know, it's something that's useless in the hobby and all of that. Well, carbon is something that does a lot for removing odors in an aquarium. So maybe you don't have carbon in your tank at all, and you should. Maybe that might be the thing that fixes your problem. Um, maybe you can put enough carbon in there to fix it. But, um, you know, you can increase your amount of carbon that you have in there by putting it in one of those little filter socks and putting it in the in the current of your water to use the carbon to filter out that odor and, and, uh, and the iron content and all of that, it'll help with the iron content, but it'll really help with the odors. Um, that's another trick. I mean, but to me, if the, if the water's that high in iron, you shouldn't have fish in it anyway. You should definitely look into getting your water from another source. So, um, I think that the combination of the two would probably be your absolute ideal scenario the combination of getting your water from somewhere else and um, adding carbon is something that will definitely clean your tank up and get that poop smell out of it. It's not the fish's fault. It's your water's fault. Uh, that's what my instincts are telling me anyway. I hope that helps you out, Amy, and thank you so much for sending that in. Folks, don't forget that you too can get your questions answered. Send them in to either KG Tropicals at gmail.com or the old address, which was for our Q&A series, kgqanda at gmail.com. You might just hear your question get answered. 
Okay, so we have reached the point in the show where it's time to talk to you about my favorite sponsors. We're coming at you with UniversalRocks.com, Dustin'sFishTanks.com, and KGTropicals.com. First of all, folks, if you haven't been on these three websites, you need to be going on them because they've got some of the most amazing things that you've ever seen. You know my website. It's KGTropicals.com. We've got everything the fish keeper needs, whether it's live fish, which for the next couple of weeks are going to be 50% off, Or you can order up all of your supplies by way of our Amazon affiliate links. I've got all of my podcast episodes. We've got a forum on there. I've got everything on there. You should definitely check out kgtropicals.com and universalrocks.com. What can I say about this? I'm the biggest fan on the planet of this company. It's not just because they're a sponsor. I've got their backgrounds all over the place. I absolutely love their products, and you will too. If you're looking for a 3D background or some decorative rocks to go into your aquarium you should definitely go over to universalrocks.com and when you're over there enter tank talk at the promo box at checkout and get a 15 percent discount on your order and then there's dustinsfishtanks.com you know who he is what's up fish tank people you know who dustin is he is that crazy guy who's all over the place on youtube well he has a website too it's dustinsfishtanks.com head over there He's got all of the most amazing live aquatic plants for your tank. He will ship these directly to your door. He's got everything that you would want on there. He's even got planted tank guides and things like that that you can buy. It's a great website. Definitely check it out. And again, just like the other one, if you enter Tank Talk in the promo box at checkout, he's going to give you a 20% discount. Are you kidding me? 20% off your live aquatic plants. You can't lose Head over to DustinsFishTanks.com and check it out. Now let's let's talk about some of the most interesting and the most common fish keeping myths. So this is a topic that I covered, um, I don't know, I guess it was about a year ago. I uh, did a video on it and I had a lot of fun. Um, it's gotten quite a few views. It's done pretty well. But um, I had a blast doing this video. And uh, so it's one of those things that I thought would do well to carry over here uh, onto the podcast. And let me just say something here real quick, folks. Uh, I'm only telling you this because I feel like you're my friends. If you hear a lot of clickety-clacking going on in the background, um, I apologize for that. I usually record these podcast episodes in the mornings, and it is actually almost 3.30 in the afternoon on Tuesday the 16th that I'm recording this. And uh, so the kids are all getting home from school. And they're quiet, they're respectful, they know I'm down here, uh, they don't make a ton of noise, the teenagers pretty much get a snack and then go up to their room. But the problem is the dogs. We've got hardwood floors in our second floor right above me, and the dogs run around like crazy every time somebody comes in the door, and that is what you hear above me, and it's really loud, I don't know if it's going to come across on the, the microphone, but if it is, that's the sound, it's my dogs going absolutely nuts upstairs. So let's talk about common myths in fish keeping. Uh, now, I have to preface this whole thing by saying that I'm pretty sure you know this by now, especially if you've listened to this episode. I work in the tropical fish industry. I'm not just a hobbyist. And doing this, I talk to a ton of people, whether it's people online emailing me, I get You know, Lisa gets messages on Instagram, I get Facebook, YouTube, it comes from everywhere. And then also people in the shop that come in and they ask us for advice on fish keeping and stuff like that. So all of these myths that I'm going to talk with you about are things that I have actually come across, people have brought to me. And let me just say this, that every single thing that I'm about to talk about has been brought up to me more than once. I mean, these are like so common that I can just spit them out, just right and left, because they come to me so much, people say these things. So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about, uh, and this is something that can be debated, and um, but, you know, it is what it is. And let me just say that this is all stuff that, that is my opinion, okay? There are some things that I'm going to talk about that I'm going to describe as myths that, People might say, well, no, John, that's a fact. It, it, it's absolutely true. And you know what? The beautiful thing is that 
We can disagree on these things and we can still be friends. I am just giving you my opinion on all of these things that I believe that these are myths. Take it or leave it. Uh, it is just my opinion. So first thing that I'm going to talk about is the infamous sentence. And it is the sentence that starts with these four words. I read online that dot, 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 dot. That is something that comes to me all the time. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, John, that's not a myth. What I mean is so many of the fish-keeping myths start with the sentence or the four words, I read online that, dot, 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 dot. I hear it all the time. And so I felt like it was something that was worthy of keeping on this or, or putting on this list because I hear it so much. And the problem is, if you haven't figured it out by now, not everything that you read online is fact, folks, because the Internet is open to everybody. The Internet is just one big conversation between anybody that wants to participate. And so when you read something online, you have no idea who wrote that. You could be reading an article or you could be reading a thread that was started by an 11-year-old that's doing a, a project in school about fish keeping and decided to ask a question or, or decided to, to give you an opinion on whatever it was that you asked. Literally, I mean, it could be a teenager. It could be somebody that's literally just learned how to type. I mean, you don't know who these people are that are putting up the, these things online. Now, the reason why I say that is because if you do a Google search or a Yahoo or whatever service that you use for your search engine, I mean, I'm pretty much assuming everybody uses Google, when you type in what is blah, 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 you're going to get a lot of results, and a lot of those results are going to be from threads and forums. And so when you read something in a forum, that's just somebody's opinion. That's a participant in that forum that gave you their opinion on whatever it is. And so you can't always take everything that you read online as being fact. Now, this is what I said in the video. If you go on a reputable website, like if you were to go on a website that is one of the big tropical fish magazines, or uh, there's a lot of them, there's some of them that I have a problem with, so I'm not going to name any particular names. But if you go on the more reputable websites, you know what I'm talking about. And you read an article that was written by, you know, somebody that's notable in this industry, whether it's an industry professional or a marine biologist or somebody like that, that you can take seriously. but it's so often that people just, whatever it is, the first thing that they read, that's what they believe is fact. And I mean, I hate to tell you, but not everything that you read online is true. So you really have to be careful with that. And you have to consider the source of where you're getting your information if you're getting your information online. Now, this also heavily applies to YouTube. It even applies to that channel on YouTube with the goofy looking bald guy named KG Tropicals. His name's John, I think. Even that guy is only giving you his opinion. He's giving you his opinion based on his experiences in the hobby and also in the industry. By no way does he ever say, or in no way, does he ever say that everything he's telling you is fact. So it, even if it's YouTube, whatever research you do online, you need to consider the source. You might just be getting your information from a hobbyist who had one experience with whatever topic it is you're looking into, and he's relaying his experience. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's fact. Okay, so this next one is, it's definitely one that will probably spark some debate. Um, but again, this is just my opinion based on my years of experience and, and everything that I have done in this industry and, and in this hobby, and that is that you have to feed fish a variety in their diet. You have to give them a bunch of different types of food. You have to manufacture all this food yourself, and you have to buy a bunch of different types of food, or else your fish are never going to grow properly, and they're never going to grow to their full potential. Me personally, I believe that that's a bunch of garbage. Now, there's a lot of scientists out there. There's a lot of biologists and stuff like that out there that would say 
that you absolutely must give a varied diet. But there's also scientists and people out there that say that no planes hit the World Trade Center on 9-11. I mean, there's people on every side of every single debate out there. And I am no scientist. But having decades of experience, I have never found there to be a difference feeding a variety of food to my fish. If you're giving your fish the proper diet, then they should be fine. Now, if you're feeding a food that is lacking in a particular thing and you need to give them extra protein so you throw in some krill, that's different. But there are people out there that will say you have to feed one particular type of food in the morning, a different type of food in the afternoon, and a different type at night. That is ridiculous. You're going to see no benefit whatsoever if you do that. I've done it, and it didn't make a single bit of difference at all. Now, the diet that you feed your fish is going to impact their development. It is going to impact the way they look and their health. Absolutely it is. But mixing it up and putting all different types of food in there, because that is what is essential for your fish's health, that's just not true, folks. These foods that are manufactured right now have everything in them to give your fish what it needs. And so giving them a variety, it's just, it's garbage. It doesn't work. Now, let me ask you this, okay? This is another thing to prove my point. We all know how bananas we all go for our dogs. And how many times do you feed your dog in a day? A lot of people feed their dogs twice a day. Do you feed them a different food in the morning than you do at night? I bet you most people that are answering that right now are saying, nope, you don't. And this this is your dog. These are the dogs that greet you when you walk in the door. You give them the same food every single day, two meals a day. Everybody I know does that. I don't know anybody that gives their dogs a varied diet unless you have these people with these little frou-frou dogs that they give them a can of tuna dog food in the morning and a can of beef dog food in the afternoon. Whatever, that's fine. What? I don't care about those people. But most people that I know, they have the bag of Purina or Old Roy or something in the cupboard, and they pull that bag out and they fill their dog's bowl up twice a day, and that's what they're feeding their dogs. I don't know anybody that mixes it up. So why is it that we have to do that for fish? It's ridiculous. You don't have to do it. Feed your fish a good quality food. Feed them multiple times a day, feed them once a day, whatever it is that you do. If you're giving them the right diet, the diet that your fish needs, herbivore, carnivore, you know what I'm saying. If you're giving them the right food, they will be fine, even if you never change a thing. Again, just my opinion. Okay, so this next one is one that people come to me and they they ask a lot. It's not necessarily something that that a lot of people give to me as a statement of fact, but it's more... They're asking me uh, because they really want to get out of doing work. And that is, is water changes too stressful for the fish? This is ridiculous. And this is a this is a lazy person's question. This is a person who doesn't want to do water changes. So they're trying to justify it by saying it's less stressful for the fish if I don't do water changes. It's ridiculous. Now, in the video that I did a, a while back, I used the same analogy that I'm going to use now. If you know me, you know I like to use the human analogy. You stick 12 people, I don't care what gender, I don't care where they're from, you put 12 people in a room together in an airtight room with no bathroom, no nothing. What's going to happen? Those people, everything's going to be fine for a few days, but (laughs) you can only hold it for so long and people are going to be relieving themselves in that room And that room, after some time, is going to start to get funky. And, I mean, it would be absolutely unbearable. If somebody was to come in and take a power washer and just wash that room out real good and pump fresh in there and just refresh everything in the room, wouldn't that make you feel better? Yeah, you'd still be pretty pissed that you're in a room with 12 people, but you'd feel so much better because you've had this environment cleaned out for you. That's exactly what happens in these aquariums, folks. These these aquariums are toilets for the fish. They're going to the bathroom in the fish. What else are they going to do? You can't litter box train them. So they're swimming in their own toilet. And so when you do a water change, you're removing water 
that that nasty, poopy, contaminated water, like Amy Jo's water, you're removing all of that and replenishing it with nice, clean, fresh water that doesn't have that poo-poo smell and isn't all gross and contaminated and full of ammonia. So there's no way that water changes are stressful for the fish. Now, let's go back to that email. Let's go back to Amy Joe's email. Amy's email, or, or Amy's water, has a lot of iron in it. and It's maybe not the best water source. And so putting that water into your tank could, in fact, stress out the fish. And so in that case, because it is bad water, that statement is water changes, or that question is water changes too stressful for the fish, could be true. But most of us have clean water, otherwise we'd all be sick. And I mean, we all either have good, clean well water, or we're on city water, or we have a filtration system on our house, or whatever it is. We all have good, clean water. So it's usually not a problem for us. But some of us, like Amy Joe, are on a well that maybe is in an agricultural area like mine used to be or whatever, and the water source is bad. That can stress out your fish. But if your water source is a good source, there's nothing stressful about the water change. Now, if you're tormenting the poor fish, if you're draining the water all the way down to where they're out of the water, or you're just being belligerent with your siphon tube and chasing the fish around and hitting them with it and pushing them. And all right, that might be stressful, but if you control yourself and you put your siphon in there and do this the way it's supposed to be done, there is nothing stressful about that. The fish will absolutely love it and they will thank you for it. All right. So I've got two more to talk with you about here. And if I'm putting these in order of my favorites, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do them in the right order, but I'm going to do them actually in the opposite order that I did them in in the video. So if, you, if you've if you seen the video, you know what these last two are, but I'm going to do them in flip-flopped order because I think that the last one is funnier than the first one. These are both kind of entertaining, um, and they're both actually kind of sad too, but uh, they're sad in their own ways. But the first one that I'm going to go with is probably the most common myth in fish keeping. Um, and it's, it's one of the most common myths that leads to some of the most mistreatment of fish worldwide, and that is that fish will only grow to the size of their tank. Now, I have people come into the shop regularly, and I'm not saying over and over, I'm saying new people that come to the shop, and they will look at me in the eye and say with a dead straight face, well, John, I mean, it doesn't really matter what size my tank is, because they'll stop growing once they get to the size of the tank anyway, right? And they they believe this to be true. They've been taught this by some idiot, and they believe that the fish is just going to stop growing, and that when that fish stops growing, that's okay. Nothing is wrong with that. Now, here's the thing. This is where it becomes a little bit difficult to explain. Yes, your fish will stop growing. However, its internal organs will not. They will continue to develop. And they will continue to get to the size that they need to. And this is actually going to be a scenario where the fish will die from the inside out. Now, in the video, I said that the fish will actually burst. And it made it sound like your your fish is in a small tank and then one day it's just going to blow up. And that doesn't happen. But the fish will actually almost die from the inside out because their organs continue to develop. Their body is too small for those organs to continue to develop, and therefore they can't function properly, and the fish will actually be very miserable, very mistreated, very unhappy, unhealthy, and eventually die because their growth was stunted by the size of their tank. So all of you people listening right now that have your Oscars in a 10-gallon tank and you think that that's okay, you need to go read a book. You need to understand that, yeah, your Oscar is going to stop growing when it gets to a certain point in your 10-gallon tank, but then it's going to die. And so if you're okay with that, if you're okay with mistreating this small little being that you paid money for and said that you were going to raise responsibly, if you think it's okay for that little innocent creature to die because of your negligence, then keep doing it and keep providing your fish store, your local fish store, with a regular customer 
that constantly has to come in and get new fish because he keeps killing the ones that he has. You're going to make your fish store very happy. Don't expect to get that fish for free under any kind of guarantee or anything like that, but you're killing your fish if you do that, folks. And I know that the vast majority of people that listen to this podcast are advanced aquarists, and you're thinking, John, we know this kind of stuff, but let me just tell you, there are more people than you think out there that believe that this is fact, that the fish will only grow to the size of the tank. And nowhere is that more prevalent than goldfish. Goldfish, in my opinion, are one of the most mistreated animals on this planet. And it's a shame that people don't know how big and beautiful goldfish actually get. But you get them in the little teeny tiny $1 fish bowl at the carnival, and you think that that's okay. It's not. You're actually dooming that fish to a very short and miserable life. So there you go. Enough of the rant. Let's get on to the funniest one. Folks, don't put your fish in a small tank. If you're going to get into this hobby and you can't afford a big tank, don't get into the hobby yet. Wait until you can get a bigger tank. Treat these fish right, and they will treat you right. So let's move on to the last one. This last one is my favorite. Okay, this next one is one of my favorites. I get a kick out of it every single time I hear this because there are so many people out there that believe this as fact, and it's it's foolish to me. I mean, it's it's almost negligent to believe that this is true. Now, I don't know if any scientific studies have ever been done. I don't know, uh, you know, that anybody's ever really written a book on this topic or anything like that. But I just know from my own experience of over 20 years that this is completely bogus. And the statement is, well, my fish have always gotten along because they grew up together. As long as you buy your fish small and they grow up together, it doesn't matter what they are. They'll always get along. Oh, Lord have mercy, folks. I I have to bite my tongue when I hear that because I don't want to be unprofessional. But the things that I could say to people who believe that to be true, I mean, so, okay, go ahead, go out there and get your red devil and your white skirt tetras and your alligator gars and your neon tetras and put all of them in the tank together and let's see what happens. Because I promise you, it ain't going to be pretty. It's going to be fine for a few days. The the cardinals are going to go really quick. They're going to probably be the first to go. And then your white skirts, well, yeah, they're going to go too. Maybe you might get lucky and your red devils and your alligator gars get along together. But for the most part, they might not either. Because guess what? Alligator gars can get like four to five feet long. So odds are that's not going to be a good matchup there either. But this is this is what people believe, folks. They just say, I'm going to get them all small, I'm going to get them really little, and they're all going to be the same size. They're going to grow up together, and so they're going to be fine, like a cat and a dog. Let me just tell you, fish will turn on each other. I've had it happen. I've had it happen more than once, where fish live harmoniously for four years, and everything is great. And then out of nowhere, boom. Somebody just flips out and decides he's going to kill another fish. It happens, and you can't see it coming, and you can't take comfort in the fact that you bought them small, and they're they're like brothers because they were raised together. No, it doesn't work that way. One of the best examples of that that I had was my albino Oscar that I have at my shop. Uh, if you know anything about the history of KG Tropicals, you've heard me talk about this fish before. It's a fish that we bought when he was the size of a quarter. And we put him in uh, when he was big. I mean, he was like eight inches when we put him in with some red devils and a jaguar cichlid and a Jack Dempsey. And, and they, and everybody got along perfectly fine. We monitored them constantly to make sure that everything was going to be fine. And they were together for like a year. Perfectly fine. Nobody ever touched anybody else. And then out of nowhere, bam, that Oscar, we come in and Lisa came in at just the right time. Because the Red Devils had, there was two Red Devils, had that Oscar down on the gravel, pounding that fish. And she got there just in time to where she could break up the fight, get that Oscar out of there, and she saved him, and he is still alive to this day. And the Red Devils have been sold. So, but they didn't get sold for like another year and a half. But anyway, you can't see it coming, folks, and you don't know whether something like this is going to happen. This can even happen in a tank 
full of the same fish. They can be brothers and sisters. You, I mean, we raise a lot of African cichlids from eggs all the way up until full-grown adults. And you can have it where you've got 12 of them that are brothers and sisters, that you've raised them since, literally since they were in the mother's mouth. And you raise them up, and then one day one of the dudes just says, that's it, I'm out, y'all are gone, and he kills everybody in the tank. It happens. So this nonsense of the fish grow up together, they're going to be fine. It's bogus, folks. Don't buy into that. If you ever go to a tropical fish store and they tell you that that's okay and they tell you that that is actually a fact, leave that store immediately and never go back. Or at least next time you go back, make sure whoever that person was that's working doesn't work that day because they're giving you probably the worst information that you could ever be given. So just because you bought them at a small size and you raised them up, it doesn't mean that they're not going to turn on each other one day. So just keep that in mind and don't make that mistake. Read the rule books and see what fish can go with what. Stick with that. Follow the rule books. Now, again, there are people out there that have gotten lucky. I've told the story multiple times about the guy that comes to our shop that has angels, or excuse me, discus with African cichlids. It's crazy, I know. But I've heard crazy stories like that, and these were not fish that were raised together either. But read the rule book and see what fish can go with what. Stick with those. Don't think that you can mix Oscars with white skirt tetras because they're, you're going to buy them all the same size and they're going to grow up together. Those white skirt tetras will eventually become a small snack for your big 12-inch Oscar. Trust me, that Oscar is going to grow a lot faster than the white skirt will. So. Don't buy into that. And again, if somebody tells you that, just run. Run very fast away from that store or never log on to that forum ever again. So, folks, I have had a lot of fun on this episode. And I hope that I didn't bore you too much in the beginning with my uh, talk of the announcement that's that's getting ready or the, the big change that's getting ready to happen here. But I hope that you can hear it in my voice that uh, it's, it's a huge relief. I mean... Lisa and I have been overwhelmed with stress over the last six months, really. And I've done my absolute best to put on a happy face for the videos and for my customers and things like that. Um, and, and I hope it's never come across that we have been under that kind of stress. But it's been brutal. And this is going to change all of that. And this is going to bring that fun back into it again. And so that's why I'm so excited and, and hopefully... You can hear that in my voice. I've had a blast with this episode. I want to thank you for listening and hanging in there with me. Uh, I don't know how long this one's going to turn out. It's probably going to be about an hour by the time I do all of my edits, but it's been a blast. Please don't forget to support our sponsors, KG Tropicals, Universal Rocks, and of course, my company, KGTropicals.com. We thank you so very much for the support, and I look forward to talking to you about common fish keeping mistakes next week. We'll talk to you then.